want to welcome everyone to our uh, to our caucus meeting today uh, as we talk about American companies doing good through supporting the mining. Uh, what you're here to share with us is very, very important. I know some of you, I, in particular John Deere, before I was elected to Congress, you guys were one of our big customers. I was a uh, I was in the transportation industry, okay. manufacturing up in Northeast Ohio, and John Deere was one of our really big customers. You and I can talk about that later. I think you guys owe us some money, but that's okay. I'm teasing, I'm teasing. Uh, but in particular, I want to thank you, uh, thank all the representatives here today from the private sector as we recognize your contributions to the demining field. To those here, from FMC, John Deere, of course, ADM, Cargill, Trimble, uh, ESRI, uh, Clandestine Materials Detection, uh, Seanstedt, have I got that right? You got that right. Um, Caterpillar, who was another one of our customers? Where's that? Where's the, where's the Caterpillar right folks? Ah, another customer. All right. And um, Reliant. Uh, we look forward to hearing more about your organizations and the valuable leadership that you're providing in the field of humanitarian demining. As we all know, around the world, landmines and unexploded ordnance continue to threaten millions of families. But with the help from corporate partners like you folks, every day the world becomes a little safer. I'm so pleased that demining is an area where the public, private, and nonprofit sectors can come together to save lives and demonstrate American values abroad. In Ukraine, exhausted civilians returning home to liberated areas see John Deere tractors sporting U.S. flags. These machines are put to work by the Halo Trust, removing the dangers from once bustling neighborhoods and ensuring that communities know that the United States is there to help. We all know Cargill, FMC, and John Deere for their work serving farmers at home, but now they're working with demining partners to clear Ukraine's farmland, farmland as well. Holy cow. Sounds like a train going through the hall. I don't know what that is. I've never heard that before. So we're grateful that they're working now with demining partners to clear Ukraine's farmland as well. As the bread basket of Europe that it's become known for, the support of these companies in the demining space is helping to restore food security uh, one acre at a time there in Ukraine. And technology made right here in the United States, like Sean Stett's magnetic detectors, Trimble and Esri's GIS software, are making demining efforts possible. While enterprises like clandestine materials detection and Reliant Global show the real good that American ingenuity can do both here at home and abroad. This event today comes at a time of unprecedented need for demining, which is why I'm going to continue to work in Congress to lead the efforts to secure greater levels of funding uh, from the U.S. government and, uh, and support for this critical work this year. Representative Houlihan and I co-led a letter gaining the support of 112 of our fellow members urging greater levels of funding for demining and I'm pleased to say that last week the House Appropriations Committee approved a funding increase for demining programs. That's good news. To the corporate partners in this space, Thank you for providing your support as well, because if you weren't doing what you were doing, it'd be a hard sell to the appropriators to do more. So it's, it's really important that we keep the pressure on. And with that, let me, uh, let me turn it over to my colleague, uh, very able uh, colleague, Representative Hulani. Thank you, sir. Thank Good you. to see Good you. Good to see you, too. Hey, everyone. Happy Thursday, baby Friday. It's really nice to be with you guys here today. I'm really, really glad to be co-chair of this very, very important caucus. And I'd like to extend my thanks and my gratitude to all of the folks who are here today. And I hope that I'm able to get to all of you. 
FMC Corporation, which is based in my home state of Pennsylvania, Clandestine Materials Detection, Sean Stett, John Deere, Caterpillar, Cargill, ADM, Trimble, Esri, and Reliant, all for being here with us today. I'm also really proud to see the positive impact that American companies, both at home and abroad, are making. And I really want to thank all of the corporate partners who are here and not maybe perhaps able to be here for the work that you are all doing to give back and to save thousands of lives as well. From those of us who are harnessing American innovation to enable the creation of detailed explosive contamination and operation maps, to those who are employing Americans to build equipment essential to the demining process, to those who are supporting demining with financial support, thank you very much for helping us make progress towards a future in which no more innocent men or women or children will be harmed by unexploded explosive devices. It's really inspiring to be able to see companies from across our nation and across industries to be able to come together today to restore land, as mentioned before, for safe use. The companies in this room are demonstrating the economic benefits at home of these life-saving programs. They're supporting jobs, as I mentioned, in places like Pennsylvania, Illinois, Minnesota, California, Colorado, West Virginia, Wisconsin, and in Tennessee. But the breadth of the companies who are in this space really goes much further as well. The Halo Trust and Mines Advisory Group relies on many others, as I mentioned, Caterpillar in Texas, RAS Core, and CEIA in Ohio, Ford in Michigan, FAE USA in Georgia, Rebel Crusher in South Carolina, and more. So now more than ever, as these conflicts in our world are raging on, we must use the leverage and be the leverage that most advances the tools that we have and the tools that we've developed by companies right here in the United States. And we simply must work together using the greatest amount of resources that we have to address the scourge of non-exploded, unexploded explosive hazards, showing countries around the world that we will still stand with them in their time of need. Here in Congress, as mentioned by my colleague, we will continue to do our part. And as he mentioned just last week, thankfully the House Appropriations Committee did approve $271 million in funding for the State Department conventional weapons destruction programs, a $7 million increase from last year. Which if you're in the environment of Washington, D.C., that's pretty remarkable. And as we all know, this funding will make it an even larger impact with your force multiplying support. So I do want to thank you all for being here today. I very much look forward to hearing more about the work that you're doing to save lives around our world. And thank you for being here to educate us and to make us aware of opportunities to work more closely together in an ongoing way across all of the sectors here present to support our partners uh, and people around the globe. Thank you for inviting us. Hi, everybody. Uh, I want to thank my wonderful colleagues, Chrissy Houlihan and Bill Johnson, the co-leads of the House UXO Caucus, not to be confused with the House UFO Caucus, <laughs> which I think is <laughs> led by Tim Burchett. <laughs> In any case, uh, I want to thank you all, uh, my colleagues, all the NGO partners, uh, and the private sector partners, particularly Cargill from my very own district that does extraordinary work uh, to feed the world, literally. Uh, and I'm grateful uh, to all of you for what you have been doing and what we surely still need to do. Uh, I will confess that uh, this was not an issue that was on my radar screen uh, in my first four years of Congress. And earlier this year, uh, in March, I took the occasion to travel to Vietnam for the first time, intentionally to visit the site where my father uh, was killed in a helicopter crash during the Vietnam War in 1969. And when we approached uh, Dragon Mountain uh, in Pleiku, uh, we didn't know where to find the crash site. And an uh, older man on a motorbike happened to pull up at the same time, who was a five-year-old boy uh, when the helicopter went down in July of 69, uh, and remembered scavenging the actual crash site. So he pointed out where it was. And we asked him if he would lead us to the site. And he resisted because he was fearful that the mines that had been planted there uh, were still in place. Uh, and was afraid to bring us there. And it was the very first time in my life that this issue very much intersected uh, with my own. Uh, we ended up making it up there, uh, but it forced me to reconcile uh, America's history, uh, existing events, of course, in Ukraine, where a lot of our focus is. In fact, just led a letter with uh, Reps Johnson and Houlihan uh, to ensure that we provide resources uh, to ensure that uh, Ukraine is demined 
especially after we will be sharing uh, cluster munitions uh, with Ukraine. Uh, but it also made me recognize that it has economic implications, of course the human implications, of which we're all well aware. Uh, and that's why I'm so grateful for you uh, and what you're doing and how you're doing it, because um, when people live in fear, when they're afraid to farm their fields for fear of explosives or, God forbid, losing their own children in those fields, uh, it compromises all of us. Uh, so I'm here to say thank you, uh, heartfelt gratitude. Uh, my learning curve is still steep, uh, but I intend to do so and become a passionate advocate uh, for ensure that we fulfill our responsibilities uh, at the federal level and we join with all of you, especially NGOs and the private sector, uh, to do it as well. And I will actually close with that question. Uh, how, uh, how do we determine best practices? Uh, how can we learn from you about what we legislators here in Washington can do better? Uh, and also, what can we do to inspire other companies uh, that have the resources, both human and economic and worldwide reach, uh, to elevate this issue? Uh, in importance to them as well. So if you might give some thought to those and share them with me, I would be grateful. Uh, consider me your friend, ambassador, and colleague on this very important work. So thank you very, very much. And with that, I don't know who I'm supposed to introduce, but I'm sure it's someone outstanding. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I am really pleased uh, to spend a couple minutes with you. I, I appreciate uh, Dean and our other partners moving forward. This is an area that has just haunted me since I first came to Congress. Uh, this is one of the areas that, of deep concern that continues to be an area where we haven't done our job as a member of Congress. But we have the legacy, toxic legacy, of 220 years of conflict in the United States. Uh, every now and then uh, there's a forest fire uh, around West Point, uh, Storm King, uh, and there are explosions because of munitions that are part of two centuries of training from the folks there. One of the things that was so shocking, and this is, I'm sorry, I'm dating myself now, this is 15 years ago, 20 years ago, when the child care center at American University was discovered to have toxic levels of chemical weapons debris. Some of you may know that American University was a site of manufacture and testing of American munitions during World War I. And then we went ahead and built the Spring Valley subdivision. And periodically people would be rototilling their backyard for landscaping and they detect munitions. And this is something that continues here in, the, in our nation's capital and around the country. Virtually every congressional district has some connection. Every state has a serious problem. And it continues to be a legacy that takes lives and injures people. The argument now dealing with cluster munitions in Ukraine is in part because we've never done a good job in terms of detection to be able to find those items. Um, I am, Ms. Ohola, I mean, that, that, you've got the all-star team here now, and I feel a little uncomfortable being here. Uh, but I really appreciate the continued focus, new members of Congress zeroing in on it, corporate partners that care, and I hope that we're going to do a better job with the Department of Defense. What we're talking about to make a major difference is literally rounding error for the Department of Defense. They're looking at spending over $2 trillion on nuclear weapons that we can't afford, can't afford to use and actually put us at risk. And we're not cleaning up the toxic legacy around the country and around the world that continues to maim and claim lives. And the, the activity in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan is one of the latest chapters. So I appreciate the, the work that's being done with the next wave of leadership in this important issue. I appreciate the fact that we have more engagement from the private sector. This has been a serious area of frustration for me. We actually had a sort of a, a, a caucus pursuing that. We tried to have a, a group that dealt with the, the people who were dealing with uh, munitions removal. And it just never got its legs. And I think that's sad because there's a lot of money to be made doing it right while we save lives and injury. Um, 
and it's at times it just reaches ludicrous situations. And I'll conclude with my favorite example of stupidity. Um, the Department of Defense was dealing with problems in Florida with munitions found near a schoolyard. And their response, not to redouble our efforts to clean it up, was, and I, I couldn't find it in my files, a cartoon book, Larry the Lizard, that tells the kids what to do when they discover munitions. That's serious business. There were children killed in San Diego uh, 25 years ago in a subdivision. It continues to be an issue at home and abroad. I appreciate what you're doing with uh, the efforts with the Demining Caucus, the new exalted uh, supercharged congressional leadership that you've got, and the recognition of the private sector that's making a difference. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, an easy thing to do from a commercial perspective to walk away from that part of the business, to walk away from employees, but uh, we would do it again in a second. As you, we didn't make a lot of public noise about that. It was more something that we felt internally we needed to do. You fast forward to earlier this year, and we started to recognize talking with our employees in Ukraine and, and people in the region that there was a, this overriding need to address demining unexploded ordinances and the disproportionate impact for agriculture. And so we went through a process of talking through a lot of issues with external advisors and, and different people in the know to decide where should we where should we go with that partnership. We ultimately said we were going to dedicate up to three percent of our revenues and sales in Ukraine towards humanitarian assistance, and we identified the Halo Trust as our uh, our partner for that project. That quickly spooled up and became just this incredible body of work and has been just one of the best partnerships we've had as you look at kind of any anything in this space and they've been just an extension of our operation and, and I can't say enough great things about the Halo team. You've got several of their representatives here today so please talk to them if you haven't introduced yourself already. Uh, the reason why you think about the, the ag story in Ukraine and there's a lot of factoids and data points out there, there's great reports, there's, I saw at least three articles today in major newspapers. Unlike some of the other countries, if you look out over the last 20, 30 years, demining also always has a tremendous impact on those countries, and often in agriculture settings as well. But in Ukraine, it's an even bigger story for a couple reasons. One because of the, the value and the need of agriculture as an economic base for Ukraine as they try to stand their country back up in the middle of a conflict. This is somewhere around 12, 13% of their GDP. So you can't have an economic success story in Ukraine without an agriculture success story. And the disproportionate amount of mines and ag lands, which is not necessarily the case if you look at other countries around the world where you might have clusters of unexploded ordinances more around villages or populated areas. This is in the farmlands. And you're talking around 30% of the farmlands in Ukraine that are mined. That's a massive footprint. You're talking twice the size of Austria, or if you combine Maryland, Delaware, Virginia, and probably add part of West Virginia in there, that's the area we're talking about. That's a huge problem. Literally a huge problem. If you do the back of the envelope calculations for every month of conflict, you're going to have a year of demining. So we're already into almost 20 years of demining. That is that's tough to bite off when you think about that as a statistic. You know, when you talk to the Tetratex or the Halos of the world or some of the people in Ukraine, I think there's, a, there's an important distinction. I was talking with the cat about it just a few minutes ago. I think you need to break that into two different timelines. There's a long arc that I think probably everybody in this room is in for to help all of these ordinances get cleaned up. And that is that probably a 20 year arc under current technology. But then there's short term values. And the reason for that is partly political and it's partly for the value of the Ukrainians and the Americans and everybody else in this 
exchange. We did set up some short-term wins for them and be creative. So instead of saying you know, a thousand hectares are, are off limits, finding out where the, the concentrations are, putting a bright line in, focus on the areas to demine, and then the rest of it you allow to continue farming and, and really make a difference. Um, so my colleagues have great respect for the Halo Trust team. Um, my, my quick window into the Halo Trust team today has and, and, uh, been very impressive. So um, thank you for what you're doing. It's, it's, uh, um, you're, you're obviously on the side of the angels, so that's, that's, a, that's a great thing. Uh, Cargill's got a couple other partnerships on mining that I guess I should just uh, call out. We're starting one uh, with F the FAO and the uh, World Food Program as well. I don't know if there's folks from either of those organizations here. Uh, trying to help small farmers, in particular focused on small farmers and demining and, and helping small farmers kind of find their way out of, out of this terrible situation. Um, and, and the third one that I'm, I'm blanking on is, as I sit here right now, um, oh, it's called Not Impossible, sorry. It was interesting as, as um, my colleague from FMC was talking, uh, and I think the congressman and some others as well talking about innovation as it relates to this, this situation. Um, there's a group called Not Impossible that Cargill's uh, partnering with or providing some funds to, um, that they're, what they do is they, they attack problems and try to... Since the beginning of the conflict, John Deere has put, um, John Deere has put tremendous effort into providing help and support to those who, are, who have been affected by this war. And our sustainability report highlights a lot of the details about some of the uh, support that we've provided, but one critical way, of course, is in our partnership with Halo Trust, um, which has been deploying John Deere tractors to assist in clearing uh, landmines in Ukraine. You can see some of the images that are flashing across the, uh, across the screens here. Um, we are grateful to the Halo Trust for their use of our equipment. Uh, they excel at modifying commercially available technologies for their use in safe and effective demining, and we could not be more proud. As a private sector company, we at Deere uh, believe that we can unleash the full power of our social responsibility in two ways. First, we can distribute funds quickly. Um, second, and perhaps more importantly, we can and should unrestrict our funds uh, so that Halo Trust team can choose the best and most impactful ways to deploy them. Because who are we uh, to tell some of the most foremost experts in this space uh, of demining with more than 30 years of experience how to, um, how to best use their resources? And in the HALO case, they use the private funding uh, from Deere to buy PPE uh, for their deminers, which could not have been done uh, with government funding. Um, so we hope that our friends at the HALO Trust can attest to the impact of this approach, and thanks for the opportunity to be here and represent John Deere. The development company and the software we create is called ArcGIS. GIS is Geographic Information Systems, which I think most of you use here. I've seen lots of heads going up and down, so maybe you've heard of us. Um, we're very happy to be part of the team here, and I think it's very important to understand that demining does require a team. We've been partners with HALO since 2008, and we also partner other demining organizations like the Geneva International Center for Humanitarian Demining out of Geneva. We have, uh, we support, we have a, a, a huge love for our nonprofit organizations. We support over 15,000 nonprofits around the world because you're doing some of the great work around the world, whether it's demining or national parks or wildlife trafficking. Uh, we are here um, you know, basically to share our story of supporting uh, this good work. Um, I myself support the State Department the most, so I started going to Ukraine in 2017 and when we were supporting the monitors that were there focusing on the line of contact. Today it's changed a lot. We haven't been back recently, but we're also using more technologies today, really trying to use disconnected analysis using more satellite imagery and of course working with great organizations that are still there in the ground. When I was there in 2017, HALO was already there. And, so, and every year they've increased, and we're here to support uh, their work and others. Um, we have great partnerships with, John, with some of you here, Trimble, John Deere, uh, you know, we're all, uh, I'm happy to see our friends here too. And I support the idea of trying to make demining a shorter time period.
because this is, it, the work that they do out there is painstakingly long and dangerous and the conditions are not easy on people. So I love the idea of continuing to use our technologies and increase this capability and make, make it a little bit faster and safer in the future. Thank you. Um, the, the largest um, recipient of donations in the history of, of the uh, Trimble Foundation. Um, we do support a lot of other organizations in, in Ukraine. Um, we supply technology to a lot of government organizations, um, the, the Meteorological Service, the Space Agency, um, and, and a bunch of others. But we're also working with three universities, one in the West in Lviv, one in Kyiv, and, and also one in um, Kharkiv, to, to establish technology training centers, um, donating both hardware and software to start preparing the, um, the, the um, group of people that are going to help rebuild the country once the, the war is won. Um, two of our main uh, business areas are agriculture and construction. Um, we, yeah, we, we work with um, many, many partners here around the room. Um, and so they're severely affected by, by the, the mine issue. Um, so we're, we're happy to support with technology and, and, and money. Um, we're working together, um, starting conversations with the, the research and development team uh, of Halo Trust um, and, and some Ukrainian engineering organizations to, um, to look at, at uh, uh, automating the process. Uh, when you have that huge area that, uh, that we, we've been discussing, you know, half the size of Texas, basically, um, that there's no way you can do it um, manually. And um, luckily, the Ukrainians are you know, super highly educated, very good engineers. Uh, we're very digitally advanced, and, and so I'm very optimistic that together we can we can um, come up with some some great breakthroughs. And in Ukraine, the, the uh, Minister of Economy is in charge of, of demining, um, and her you know um, someone mentioned a um, like a, a space shot goal. Um, her, her plan is to have uh, the mines removed in five years, um, and to employ up to 10,000 people to to do this. Uh, you know, it's going to depend on funding and it's going to depend on partners like Halo Trust and, and uh, others around the world. Um, but that's, that's her um, stretch goal, that's her target. Um, so, so we're very happy to help. Um, thanks again for the opportunity and um, yeah, together we can figure this thing out. Based out of West Virginia, Seanstead is a world leader in the design and manufacture of underground magnetic locators. They're capable of detecting ferrous metal or iron objects up to 18 to 20 feet below the surface of the ground or six meters. Um, while Seanstead's products are commonly used by land surveyors uh, for finding property corners and you know, property pens and utility departments and municipalities, both within the U.S. and around the world, they're also uh, capable of finding the ferrous metal content that is in mines, bombs, unexploded ordnance, and explosive, re explosive remnants of war. So in 2007, Shansa was still a small business, um, 25 to 30 employees founded uh, in 1953, and we hit an inflection point. We make these iconic yellow locators um, on the screen right there. And we sell it to NGOs and partners all around the world, but we stopped and asked ourselves, how can we help make even more of a difference? And from that is where the Seanstead Humanitarian Demining Initiative was born. So through the Seanstead Humanitarian Demining Initiative, uh, we do a lot of grassroots fundraising, and then Seanstead matches the donations unit for unit. So two locators go out in that person or organization's name. Uh, and then we partner with the United Nations Mine Action Service or the U.S. State Department to figure out where in the world these products are needed that they may not otherwise be able to afford to purchase them and to ensure that they make it into the hands of vetted deminers. So through our work, um, some of the countries that we've deployed locators to to date, we've shipped uh, over 600 magnetic locators at no cost to the receiving country besides shipping and handling. Some countries that we've shipped to uh, through this program would include Afghanistan, Iraq, Somalia, Sudan, South Sudan, Libya, um, Mali, and our next area of focus is gonna be supporting to get some locators into Ukraine. So Reather's Seanstead magnetic locator is being used to detect a 
200 or 2,000 pound bomb that's dropped out of an aircraft, or ammunition stockpiled deep in the ground. Each employee out of our West Virginia manufacturing facility comes to work every day knowing that we are helping make a difference. We are making a conscious effort to save lives and save limbs every day when we make our products. Um, we're part of a much bigger company now. We were acquired by Radio Detection, who partners with quite a few companies in this room that I've stumbled on the names. Um, but I can't thank you enough for your attention to this important matter, and thank you for the time today. We um, are very happy to be here, and I appreciate the time that you're all taking to uh, be here today. It's Clandestine materials detection is a <clears throat> brainchild of the University of Wisconsin that has developed this technology and patented it that we can detect the explosive inside of that landmine IED and unexploded ordnance using a drone that can literally stay up indefinitely. That's what's unique out there. You see some of these pictures um, even on our screen where people are out there with the magnetometers and going out there in, in a very arduous process using dogs or rats or, or landmine sweepers. And we can do it from as far away as a kilometer. And we can penetrate as deep into the ground as a, a meter and detect that explosive that's there, not the metal casing or anything like that. So there's a huge difference. And the fact that we can cover, every, you know, a lot of people are talking, well, this is going to take 10 years, it's going to take 20 years, it's, I've heard four to five decades to do the, the contaminated area in Ukraine. We can do it in a very short order of time with this technology, and uh, that's what the farmers are begging for. They can't afford to wait decades to get their land tilled and raising crops. They need it as soon as possible, and we feel that we can make a difference and, and help everybody in that capacity. Certainly enjoy being part of this group here today. Um, so. Rely Global is more on the implementer side of, for the for-profit organizations. Much like HALO on the nonprofit side, uh, Reliant really targets Department of State and their programs that are more competitive based and uh, we work in the federal space on that side of it. So just for some context there. Um, so headquartered in Tennessee, Reliant was founded in 2006 and we were born out of the post-conflict recovery mission in Iraq. Our founding and contingency operating theater resulted in a mission-oriented, risk-tolerant, customer-focused company. We embraced the most complicated projects in the most challenging locations, much like this room. Um, at our core, Reliant is a global operator. Our approach centers on developing local-first solutions around the world. Our services include construction, munitions response, training, emergency and disaster response, facilities maintenance, force protection, and expeditionary stability support services. So we are uh, a full service uh, company that um, essentially developed the capability to, to support multiple areas of business because of being in those emergency uh, uh, locations. Um, one of, excuse me, um, I'm reading, I still lose my voice. <laughs> One of uh, Reliance's first major clearance projects was in support of the USACE's AED South program to, uh, in Afghanistan to remove munitions. Reliance performed over 80% of the clearance efforts across southern and western Afghanistan between 2008 and 2012, clearing over 40 million square meters of land in 33 locations in Afghanistan, establishing Reliance as a global leader in munitions response. From Afghanistan, our success in the global mine action and humanitarian to mining realm continue to grow. We're now in the Pacific Islands, where we have been instrumental in performing battle area clearance efforts across Guam and the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands, in support of the construction expansion and the U.S. expansion in those regions. We also have a large U.S. program focused on active and inactive range clearance activities. We support the mining efforts in Africa, and most recently uh, began working in Ukraine in uh, 2022, performing training. Uh, Reliance Mine Action and Humanitarian Demining Program has proven solutions in complex environments. 
We are reducing threats caused by hazardous munitions stockpiles, explosive remnants of war, unexploded ordnance, landmines, and improvised explosive devices. Unique to Reliant is our ordnance database. So we currently have an ordnance database that includes over 6,000 worldwide munitions and identifies safe handling and destruction, um, uh, I guess, um, methodology for each one. Um, also unique to Reliant is that we operate the only UX training program in the U.S. So Reliance uh, U.S. UXO Tech 1 and IMAS Level 1 training program through a partnership with the University of Tennessee is the only full-time school with the highest commercial level of operational training available to commercial UXO technicians in the U.S. We offer a unique comprehensive solution for UXO students through our organizational accreditation with the United Nations Mine Action Unit in compliance with international mine action standards and DOD qualifications. Our graduates are currently working all over the world. Uh, because of our history and the living training programs, we've also successfully grown into the provision and delivery of not only UXL EOD training, but also counter IED training and programs um, to host country nationals in support of the U.S. partner nations and the UN. Just in the past 24 months, Reliant has developed and delivered UXO, EOD, and counter IED training to host country nationals in the governments in Mali, Burkina Faso, Togo, Chad, and Nigeria. We also recently were awarded a contract to provide EOD Level 2 and Level 3 training to government officials in Ukraine. That project kicks off in September and we're very excited to be uh, involved in that initiative. Uh, in Africa, Reliant is the leading provider um, for counter IED training programs uh, on behalf of the Department of State. So that mostly stems from our um, what's called the Department of Africa program but we have been providing training um, across Africa in those spaces. So again, we're honored to be here and appreciate the time uh, and interest, and we are excited about the opportunity to continue to work with HALO and in the space where for-profit and non-profit will start to work, because I know it's gonna take a lot to, uh, to get done what needs to be done in Ukraine. So again, thank you.